Hey everyone, today we are going to learn the basics of fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, commonly known as FLIM. But first, what is fluorescence? It is the emission of light by an object after it has absorbed electromagnetic radiation. Specifically, electrons in the ground vibroelectronic state of an atom or molecule denoted by S0 absorb incident radiation and jump to an excited state denoted by S1. The subsequent relaxation of the electron from S1 to S0 results in emission of light as fluorescence. For single photon absorption processes, the energy of incident radiation is more than that of emitted radiation. Thus, the wavelength of emitted radiation is always larger. Other than light, chemical, heat and mechanical energy can also be used to excite electrons to higher states, resulting in chemi, thermo and triboluminescence respectively. In a standard fluorescence measurement, a light source is used to illuminate the sample, and emission is measured perpendicular to the direction of excitation. Fluorescence intensity and wavelength are the primary observables. However, with the addition of sophisticated instruments like the time-correlated single photon counting or TCSPC unit, fluorescence lifetime measurements can also be done. As fluorescence intensity decay is a first order process with respect to time, the intensity at any time t can be obtained from the given equation. The total rate of decay of electrons from the excited state, denoted by kt, depends on the total number of decay pathways, whether through radiative or non-radiative decay. Fluorescence lifetime tau is inversely proportional to the total decay rate. Thus, with the increase in decay pathways, the decay rate will increase, thereby leading to shorter fluorescence lifetimes. A fluorescence lifetime imaging setup, or FLIM setup, typically consists of a pulsed laser system illuminating a sample on a laser scanning microscope, which sends the fluorescence photons to a single photon counting detector. A time-correlated single photon counting, or a TCSPC unit, also known as a very expensive stopwatch, is connected and synchronized with all these other units. The laser system provides the TCSPC with a start signal and the detector with a stop signal the moment a fluorescence photon is detected after excitation. The TCSPC then compiles the data and sends it to the computer, which analyzes and presents the decay analysis and a nice false colored fluorescence lifetime image. For fluorescence lifetime measurements, the time between pulsed excitation and appearance of first photon is noted. This is a stochastic process, typically ranging from a picosecond to a nanosecond. By repeating the excitation emission process several times, a histogram of counts versus time is developed. Most photons reach the detector soon after the excitation pulse, followed by a drastic decrease in the number of photons with time. Fluorescence lifetime is determined by fitting this histogram with an exponentially decaying function. A multi-exponential fit implies multiple lifetimes, which in turn indicates the possible presence of multiple fluorophores with different lifetimes. If those fluorophores are isolated and measured separately, then the resultant mono-exponential decays for each fluorophore would resemble the plot shown. Lastly, in real life, the excitation pulse is not a delta pulse, which implies that it is wide, thereby leading to convolution of signals. Hence, deconvolution of the instrumental response function from the decay function must be carried out to obtain the true signal. In a technique called fast flim, the fluorescence lifetime images are built up pixel by pixel and displayed during acquisition. Start-stop times between laser pulse and arrival of first photon are recorded and the average lifetimes are used to reconstruct images by iterating the process for each pixel. Resultant images are then displayed in a pseudo-color map. When analyzing large areas of the image, multi-exponential decays are often observed, indicating the presence of molecules with different fluorescence lifetimes. Softwares analyze and separate the different components of decay and spit out the result. A few advantages of FLIM are that it is not sensitive to the concentration of the species present. And that, due to minimal photon scattering, especially in thick samples, it can be used to study neurons in the brain, which typically scatter a lot of photons and hence are hard to characterize via other methods. One main disadvantage of FLIM is that the imaging is diffraction limited, as light is used to illuminate the samples. Thus, it finds applicability in studying large structures relevant mostly to biologists, 
and not in imaging atoms or molecules which would be more relevant to physicists and chemists. Flynn exploits the fact that fluorescence lifetimes depend on molecular environment and not concentration, and hence finds applicability in mapping environmental factors within cells such as pH and hydrophobicity. When combined with Forster Resonance Energy Transfer or FRET, it has also been used to study protein folding and binding interactions between large molecules. A recent breakthrough made possible by FLIM has been intracellular temperature mapping, which was published in Nature Communications by Okabe, Inada, et al. in 2012. The scientists have demonstrated intracellular temperature mapping for the first time based on a fluorescence polymeric thermometer or FPT and using FLIM. As evident from the pictures, the temperature distribution within a COS7 cell indicates that the nucleus is at a higher temperature than the cytoplasm. Local heating around the mitochondria is also observed after treating it with 4 trifluoromethoxyphenylhydrazone or FCCP, which inhibits ATP synthesis. Variation of temperature along different stages of a cell cycle, in this case G1 phase and G2 phase, have also been shown. And with that, let me end your suffering and thank you for your patience.